All right, so let me introduce my uh, friend and colleague, Phil Malone, uh, professor here at Harvard Law School, director of the Cyber Law and Intellectual Property Clinic. Um, and he is going to take us through the um, analogous conversation about who owns this law. Professor Malone. Uh, well, thank you, Carl. And let me just echo what John said. I think this, uh, having this workshop here, having this be the culmination of 15 of these that Carl has not put together, uh, is really pretty astounding. And we're, we're all lucky to be part of it and be able to contribute in whatever way we can. Uh, I've had the uh, pleasure and the benefit of looking back over some of the previous ones um, just to see what's been said about copyright, because this is an issue that's been addressed in, in a lot of detail in some of the prior uh, workshops. And it's just, it's really quite amazing. The people that you've gotten together, the breadth of the perspectives and experience, and um, the topics that you've dealt with and they've dealt with. Uh, one of the things we've sort of touched on all along the way that I'm going to come back to again, uh, in terms of thinking about this whole area, um, is just, you know, how do we make this real? How do we actually achieve something? And what Carl is doing is probably hands down the best way to do it. Actually get out there, create uh, knowledge, create information, uh, create commitment and body and by a whole range of people. Uh, you're essentially creating all of the relevant facts on the ground that are going to make this happen. Uh, and that just kind of pushes past bureaucratic resistance, legal resistance like copyright and a lot of other things. So I commend you hugely on pushing so hard, being so determined, and getting to this point. Okay, I want to be real clear, this isn't just me, right? There's a whole bunch of people who have been doing these workshops. And, um, you know, Tom Lewis, for example, has been at least at five or six of these and has organized the two-day workshops. So um, I appreciate the, the kind words, but I, I do want to make very clear this has been a, a large number of people doing this. Right, fair enough. So um, uh, I'm here to talk about copyright and other uh, limitations, restrictions, impediments to uh, the use of the material that we're talking about. Um, and I guess I want to begin by restating the totally obvious, which is that, you know, for the last day and a half um, here, we've been talking about uh, the tremendous value to society, to legal institutions themselves, to citizens that come from having free and open access to primary legal materials. Uh, and it's both uh, so that citizens have access um, and can use the material. And as Larry Lessig said yesterday, it's also the benefit that comes from people being able to take the underlying core materials and, and build on top of them, to innovate on top of them as a platform. Whether it's people developing uh, really cool, easily accessible front ends, whether it's search engines, whether it's mashing them up into uh, various other services or tools that let people use the law in new ways. There's a tremendous amount of secondary innovation on top of the core legal materials that can happen, that can be unleashed by all of this. Um, but all of this depends, the personal citizen use, the platform use, the innovation use, all depends on open, free access. Access not being restricted by things like copyright. Uh, and so, uh, I want to focus on a couple of pieces today. One is the copyright angle that's come up a bunch of times already and that you've heard a bit about. Uh, and the second one is uh, sort of a different uh, variation uh, on that, which is other restrictions. Uh, and, and typically those are terms of use or contractual restrictions that come up, usually in the electronic context. Whether or not there's a copyright claim to be made, there are often invocations of sort of secondary restrictions, uh, contract and so on. So we're going to talk about that a little bit. Um, so I think it strikes most of us as more than a little crazy that uh, the public law, the actual statutes of our states, our countries, our cities, the court decisions, the rules and regulations that we're required to obey and live by um, might not be available to everybody in an easy way, so if they can understand it. I mean, that just seems sort of nutty, and yet uh, this is an issue that keeps coming up uh, over and over again. So what does the law actually say? What does copyright tell us about whether or not um, uh, states, municipalities, other entities can assert copyright over legal materials? 
Uh, as with a lot of things, some things I think are crystal clear, and there's no dispute. Some things are pretty darn clear, you can be very comfortable, and there are other things where it's just not so clear, you don't quite know, we don't yet have enough experience with it to say for certain, uh, but we can make some pretty good guesses. Um, so what's crystal clear? Well, one of the things that's really clear, fortunately, uh, is that there's no copyright in federal government materials, period. So Section 105 of the Copyright says there's no copyright protection for any work of the United States government. And a work of the government means uh, any work that's prepared by an officer or an employee as part of that person's official duties. So that goes way beyond just court decisions and statutes, right? That's anything the government prepares. That's great. It's a fundamental part of the copyright law. No dispute about that uh, at all. Um, that's the easy part, that's the crystal clear part. What about state laws and state legal materials? Well, you notice uh, section 105 here doesn't say anything about states, right? It's silent as to any governmental entities other than the federal government. So we don't get any um, guidance there. The general rule, though, I think most people would agree, is that for primary materials, the actual texts of court decisions, opinions, statutes, uh, and so on, uh, there is not copyright protection. So uh, if we go to Nimmer, one of the leading uh, copyright experts, he's pretty unequivocal, right? On and hell, no copyright may be claimed in state court opinions or federal court opinions, which we know uh, state statutes are likewise regarded as being in the public domain. Now, Nimmer, influential as he is, is not the law, he's not the Supreme Court saying this. Um, there are some very old Supreme Court cases that certainly suggest strongly uh, this, um, but they're old, nicely. Uh, Massachusetts, long, long ago in uh, 1886, uh, seemed to make this pretty clear. Uh, and essentially basing it on this almost due process argument, right? Their citizens are expected to obey the law, and they have to know what the law is, and there's just not uh, an acceptable matter of public policy to say, well, you have to obey the law, but we're not going to make it available to you or accessible to you so that you know what you're supposed to be doing. Um, So it, it actually makes sense for a number of reasons, right? The obvious one is this. If you've got to know the law and obey it, then you better have access to it. You shouldn't have to uh, pay for it. You shouldn't have to not be able to get it because you can't access uh, the particular paid service or whatever that's providing it to you. Um, but there are a couple of other uh, sort of very basic arguments behind why primary legal materials should not be copyrightable. One of them is just the purpose of copyright. Okay, we've touched on this a bunch, Larry Lessig hit it hard yesterday. I mean, we have copyright laws for a reason. The Constitution actually uh, provides the basis for intellectual property protection in copyright law. Uh, but it does it by saying to promote the progress of science and useful arts. And so there's a specific purpose. We don't give copyright just to make money for the sake of making money. We do it in order to incent creation. We do it to provide an incentive so that people will create new content and materials that we wouldn't otherwise have, and that, as Larry said yesterday, society will then benefit from. So there are two parts there, incenting creation that wouldn't, that wouldn't otherwise occur, and then the material that gets created as a result of that benefits everyone. Um, that seems kind of silly when we're talking about it in the context of judicial opinions and statutes. It doesn't make any sense to say that judges write their opinions not because they're judges who write opinions because that's their job, but they do it so that they or the state can somehow lock these opinions up and charge money for them. Of course, I mean, that's just crazy. That, that completely doesn't connect with the purpose of copyright. Um, same thing for legislatures. Do we really think it makes any sense to say that legislatures, uh, municipal councils, and so on pass laws so that because they know that there's a financial reward that comes from exercising a proprietary right and selling access to them to West Long so on. No, it's crazy. These are fundamental purposes of government. Uh, and we don't need, and it doesn't make any sense to think of the incentive of copyright as the, the reason that they get created or the spur to their creation. Now we have to be a little careful because there's a difference between this ex ante incentive to create, which the copyright laws are all about, and something that's come up a bunch of times that Larry talked about yesterday, which is an ex post revenue stream that can come from these things. Just because we don't need 
uh, copyright law and the promise of reward to make the legislature do its job and write statutes and to make the attorney general do his job uh, and issue opinions. Turns out that in some cases they can sell these things to vendors uh, like LexisNexis or West or others for a fair amount of money uh, and then that money is a revenue stream that they wouldn't otherwise have. So we have to deal with the money part and the practical effect that that has. That's not a copyright issue. It's not about the sort of ex ante incentive to create. Um, so I think we need to sort of take that, recognize it exists, take it off the table. So if it's this clear, if, if there's absolutely no right in federal materials and state primary materials seem awfully clearly uh, not within the scope of copyright, then why is this such a big deal? And why are we talking about this? Why has Carl and others had you know, a number of presentations about this in, in previous panels as well as this one? Well, it turns out for a number of reasons. So we heard yesterday, uh, I think maybe it was uh, on Marnie's panel, that uh, uh, surveying Massachusetts, turns out there are a bunch of municipalities and others that, that put copyright notices on it, actually has seen to assert copyright in various official legal materials that they create. Uh, I think some of uh, the work that's come out in other workshops, Carl has suggested that at least eight states uh, still put copyright notices or purport to uh, be asserting copyright for their statutes, their primary legal materials, in spite of what seems to be a pretty clear uh, statement uh, that they can't do that. So what? I mean, you know, the law seems to say you can't do it, they do it, why not just ignore them? <laughs> we'll talk about that. You know, ignoring them sometimes is not a good, not a bad strategy, you just charge ahead. The problem is, Ignoring them for Carl, ignoring them for the law of gov movement is one thing because they have a huge amount of credibility, momentum, good uh, pro bono lawyers like EFF standing behind them. Uh, but remember what we're talking about, the Lessig's idea of, of uh, legal materials as a platform for innovation, uh, people being able to do all these great things, or whether it's just you know the law student that, that Carl was talking about yesterday you know, who takes the materials and scans them and puts them up. Uh, some of those people, maybe a lot of those people, are going to be chilled by the fear of a copyright lawsuit. They're not really, they're, they're a little more risk averse, they're not really going to stick their necks out uh, and maybe risk being sued by uh, the Legislative Council of Oregon or the state of Wisconsin uh, or someone else. And so the mere uncertainty, the mere fact that these notices get asserted, even though they sound silly to us and they're good arguments that they are silly, uh, until we've sort of beaten that argument down uh, and made it really clear that it's not valid, it's going to continue to get in the way. It's going to actually block some of what it is we're trying to do. So the more we can bring clarity to the subject, both by studying and talking about it and by you know, standing up when the issue arises. So taking on Oregon, taking on other uh, instances down the road, the more it's going to matter. So that's why we're, we're actually spending some time to talk about it today and, and other days. Um, Second reason it's important is, you, you know, when we're talking, the, the, the kinds of materials we're talking about creating access to aren't just limited to statutes and uh, decisions. There's a whole range of, uh, you know, secondary materials and other things uh, beyond just um, the uh, uh, primary texts that we're talking about. Uh, and so, um, the law is a little bit clearer, less clear about those, and we need to, to think about them and talk about them a little. I want to mention just a couple and, and spend a minute talking uh, about a couple. So in addition to primary materials, uh, you often sometimes see additional content described broadly. So if you look at you know, uh, Westlaw or LexisNexis, you not only get the text of the decision, you get their cute little star pagination issue uh, stuff if you're Lexis Nexus, you get the actual pagination through West, you get head notes, you get you know the syllabus of the decision, you get a lot of information about the court and so on. Uh, you get other kinds of materials and rules, for example, this came up in the Oregon case, you get commentary, uh, you may get sort of annotations and other materials. There's a lot of stuff that goes along with it that, that you know maybe is created by the government, uh, maybe is created by a private vendor like West or uh, LexisNexis, we have to think about the copyright issues there. 
And then there's a separate issue about what happens when you have a private uh, entity. You have the American Law Institute writing model statutes or model laws, or you have you know the uh, a, a national electrical body writing some sort of electrical code or a plumbing code, some kinds of other codes. Uh, and those then get adopted into law. The texts of those then become the actual law. What happens in that case? It's a little bit different because you don't have the initial drafting, the initial creation done by uh, government employees who are doing this because that's their job to create the law. So, so those are both a little bit complicated. Let's spend just a minute on each. Um, uh, so interestingly, the, the sort of other um, additional content, things beyond just the strict text, uh, was part of the issue, part of what came up in Carl's case. Um, and so if you look at the lovely uh, cease and desist letter that he got, uh, uh, this is to Justy that uh, confident you got your own or were included in this. Uh, Tim, Tim got the letter and we kind of bellied up to the bar since we worked with Justia very carefully and we, we essentially interjected ourselves. Us too. Sue so us too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. You don't often have people saying that. It's wonderful in this context. But notice what the committee is saying here. They're sort of acknowledging the obvious that they don't claim a copyright in the text of the law itself, um, but they do claim a copyright in the arrangement and subject matter compilation of Oregon law prefatory and explanatory notes, the lead lines and numbering for each statutory section. So you know whether something is section 103.2 or 107.9, that's really great copyrightable material according to the uh, uh, committee. Um, uh, and so there are lots of things like this uh, that come up that go beyond just the, the sheer text. So even if the rule was 100% clear, it's close to that about the actual text, you have these other uh, materials, these other bits that, that um, uh, aren't exactly the same, kind of come close to that. So in the Oregon case, uh, the state, the committee backed down and they said we're not going to assert copyright after lots of great pushing and essentially uh, you guys telling them we have a declaratory judgment action ready to go. By the way, here's a link to the complaint if you want to look and see what we're going to say when we sue you. Uh, you know, go ahead, make our day, let us sue you. Um, they then held hearings and voted and said, oh, no, no, actually, we don't want to invoke uh, copyright here after all. Um, but that doesn't always happen. Uh, and there have been a few reported decisions in the law is, I would say, less than clear. Uh, so there are a couple of cases. One, a district, federal district court from Minnesota. Uh, another one, the Eighth Circuit, um, dealing with West's um, page numbering system for their decisions online. Both of those cases said, actually, that's, that's original creative expression sufficient to give them a copyright and if someone else comes along um, uh, and copies their actual pagination, they're infringing the copyright. That's a, and it could be a really big deal, right? We've heard in some cases, we heard yesterday that some of the uh, Massachusetts, lower Massachusetts decisions are only reported through the Mass Law Reporter. You don't have an official version, and the only pagination you can officially cite to until we get paragraph numbers uh, as the norm is this uh, you know, West created or some vendor created page number, but you can't copy it without infringing the copyright. Uh, that's a real problem. Fortunately, the Supreme Court came along in the mid 80s and decided the Feist case, which basically said, well, wait a minute, facts are not copyrighted. You've got to have a modicum of originality and creativity in something before it can actually be copyrightable. And things like the phone book, you know, putting something in alphabetical order, sorry, those are facts, you know, you're doing a little bit, the sweat of the brow is certainly not enough to make it copyrightable. It's gotta be some originality. Uh, and then later cases dealing with West uh, have done a much better job of recognizing uh, that in fact the star pagination system uh, and other stuff, uh, the arrangement of sections, the information, they, the sort of way they rearrange at the beginning, the parties and the judge and the um, uh, case number and the attorneys and sort of the procedural posture. All of those are really just factual pieces of the opinion and they're not adding anything that's sufficiently original. So the sort of, I think by far the best reason uh, best outcome is the, the Matthew Bender versus West case from the Second Circuit, uh, which said, no, no, that's not copyrightable. Um, problem is, you know, the Eighth Circuit's case, earlier case is still sitting out there, 
Um, again, if we're talking about some uncertainty in the law and some chilling of people who might otherwise want to do things, it's a little bit of an issue when you can say, well, all right, we're in the Second Circuit, somebody follows the Second Circuit's rule, great, but you know, if somebody wanted to, to rely on this Eighth Circuit decision still sitting there, uh, you know, it could be a problem. So it's another example of lack of clarity, a little bit of uncertainty, uh, probably leading to uh, some showing some uh, uh, less uh, use uh, innovation and so on that we might otherwise see. It gets a little bit more complicated if we're talking about something beyond just pagination. Uh, and I think in one of these cases, Wes actually admitted that instead of having some creative genius sitting there going, aha, this is the place for paragraph you know, uh, 9 to turn into paragraph 10. And as somebody said yesterday, you know, I, I know, why don't we start this part of the book at page 937? You know, instead of that, it's all an automated process. So there's, there is no uh, originality or creativity. But beyond that, you know, some of these other things are harder. So Wes's head notes, for example, uh, you know, where they sort of categorize and, and come up with you know, where they think it belongs in a way of describing what it means, um, uh, annotations, uh, commentary, things like that. There's, a, there's certainly a stronger argument there that that is original, that is sufficiently creative. Um, and so there's a spectrum. I think you've got a decent argument that there are copyright restrictions when you get that kind of uh, ancillary additional stuff that you absolutely don't have with the underlying core material and you probably don't have with the closely surrounding material like pagination uh, and so on. Um, Back to that issue of um, private codes for uh, instances where we have uh, a private um, uh, body like an electrical standards body or a plumbing body or something. Uh, the cases are a little bit mixed. There are cases from different circuits. Uh, a couple of them, the First Circuit and the Fifth Circuit, say uh, where this kind of privately drafted material actually <coughs> adopted as the substantive law where you actually say, all right, you know, these 16 pages of the Uniform Electrical Code, or whatever it is, are now plopped down wholesale into our statute, you must obey those words, then those cannot be subject to copyright. And it's primarily on this sort of due process argument that citizens have to know what the hell they're supposed to do when they're wiring their house or uh, doing their plumbing. Um, and you can't say, oh no, no, someone owns the copyright in that. Cases have gone the other way, have dealt with situations where there's been a statute that has referred to uh, the provisions of certain codes, um, sort of built them into the law in an operational way without sort of wholly adopting them, wholly incorporating them. So there's a little bit of a distinction there. You can still get some laws that you can't really understand very well unless you look at the referred to materials where courts have said, no, that doesn't completely vitiate copyright in those materials. But certainly in cases where you take the uh, whatever it is, the ALI proposed model law where you take the electrical code and you just drop that into your statute and adopt it, uh, then we're not going to allow copyright in that case. Um, Alright, so that's copyright. Um, get this to work. Uh, um, so as I mentioned, the other piece of this that in some ways is a lot more interesting, we're beginning to see a lot more, is people using uh, contractual restrictions as something of an end run around copyright, as a way to create some exclusive control over something where there isn't a copyright in the first place. Um, most common are terms of service, user agreements, user license agreements, and so on, on websites where there's electronic material. And essentially, uh, you know, what happens in those cases is someone says, all right, I'm putting up a bunch of stuff here in order, you know, in order to come onto my site, in order to even look at any of this, you must first agree to the following terms of service. You must enter into a contract with me that governs how you will use this. If you then do something that the terms don't allow, they can't sue you for copyright if they don't have the underlying copyright. It doesn't create a copyright that doesn't exist, but they can sue you for breach of contract. And in many cases, depending on how they're presented and what the terms are, these kind of you know, click-through uh, agreements, terms of service agreements, are perfectly binding. And courts have been quite willing to uh, say that they form binding contracts. Um, so uh, you know, a good, just very simple example is to look at the, the West 
uh, user agreement, the Westlaw agreement for um, If you look at West's, uh, this is for the law school uh, version of West law, uh, but it basically, um, then, you know, this is one you have to click I agree, um, and your access to and use of all this are subject to the terms of the agreement below. So this becomes a contract uh, that you're bound by, provides all sorts of, you know, limitations, but one of the things it says is that users may not copy, download, straight, blah, 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 uh, the data or any of any portion of the data except as we say. Downloaded data cannot be stored or used in an archival database or other searchable database except as otherwise expressly permitted. Now, I haven't studied all these precise terms, but what this kind of thing typically can mean is if you want to create, you know, if you're Justy or someone else, you want to create a database of all of the uh, Federal Court of Appeals opinions for the last 20 years, you can't go to Westlaw, download all of them, cut and paste the text out, and put them into your database. There's no copyright in that. It's a matter of copyright, they can't stop you. But in the contract you have to agree to in order to go on and actually look at any of this, you agree that you're not going to do that. Um, and we see that a lot. You know, if you think about the kinds of materials that are online, uh, primarily or only they're available, uh, primarily or only online in an electronic form, almost always some kind of user agreement. Uh, user license and so on. And, and this can come from two sides. You can get this from vendors like West who take the material and, and post it. Or you can get it from governments. You know, it is not unheard of. There are plenty of cases and one more cases where government entities that put up the, uh, whatever it is, the, the code regulations or the something else for a state or a municipality or something, or they put it on a, a CD-ROM for distribution if it's, you know, uh, certain kinds of code require you to enter into a usage agreement before you can actually even look at it and the usage agreement restricts what you could otherwise do as a matter of copyright. I um, just want to note, just because it's, it's quirky and interesting, there's a new uh, example of this, it's a great dispute that's just arisen, uh, regarding uh, sort of crime data and police data. So you get a case here, this company called Public Engines buys, is, is um, actually paid by police departments around the country, it gets crime data from them, it sort of massages it, takes out some stuff, formats it in certain ways. And the reason it does that is it's sort of under contract with these uh, police agencies. But it also posts this stuff on its site, crimereports.com. So one of its competitors came along and said, wow, look at that cool data. Wouldn't we love to have that for our own service? So they basically scraped it all, used it for their own site and their own service, and popped it up uh, and got sued. Um, a lawsuit, uh, so got sued by the underlying company. Um, interestingly, and I think sort of nice, slightly encouraging, uh, the complaint doesn't include a copyright claim. They at least recognize that this stuff is factual. You know, we're just talking about, you know, Joe Smith called the police at X time and reported that there was something, and, you know, and whatever little modifications they made, uh, anonymizing things and so on, are not sufficient. So there's no copyright claim. There are a lot of other claims in there, including uh, breach of the terms uh, and violation of a federal statute called the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, uh, based on the violation of the terms of service that said, if you look at our site and come here, you shall not do all these things, including taking it and putting it on your own site. So increasingly, we're going to see, I think, uh, these sort of terms of service from both vendors and public entities around uh, legal materials as an issue that has to be dealt with, and there's very little case law. There's certainly very, I think no case law as far as I know that deals with, uh, so let's say a state tried to take its laws, um, didn't assert copyright, but basically said the only way we're going to make them, the only way we're going to show them to anyone is we're going to put them on this website. Totally available, they're up there, but you've got terms and conditions and they restrict what you do. Would that be enforceable? I think there are very good arguments that it's, it would be void as against public policy because it doesn't allow the kind of full use uh, that some of the cases have talked about for citizens, but it's not clear. And that's beginning to happen, by the way. Maryland, for example, shifted from print to electronic, and rather than a certain copyright, they, they simply say as a matter of statute, you're not allowed to do it. Not copyright, but, but, but law. Right, right. 
So it's, it's really substituting physical access. Like we have control over this thing. Yeah, the law exists, but it's in, in this little binder, electronic binder. And the only way you can look at it is through here. And in order to let you do that, we're going to have a contract. Yeah. So if, if, if you want to make that kind of, I, I guess, utility based argument, but in many ways, how would you, I, because this is a particularly problematic case, I think, how would you look at something like the official comments to the UCC? Which I think is actually the most egregious example of <laughs> something that actually should be on the public domain. Any take on that at all? I don't know. I mean, I think uh, not specifically, but I, I think it comes down to the closer it gets to being, you can't use the UCC. You can't understand what it means. You can't understand how it's going to be applied, how courts going to decide it without looking at the official comments. That's starting to look a lot like, uh, you know, these are things that have been adopted by uh, states that say we adopt the UCC. Um, you know, it's it's sort of in that middle ground where they haven't plopped it down in the statute, you know, and made it an official part. But you actually need it. It's essential uh, in order to figure out what it is that citizens are supposed to do. So I think there's at least arguments to be made that, you know, from a due process standpoint, a policy standpoint, that you shouldn't be locking this stuff up under copyright. As a practical matter, we've always been able to evade most of the restrictions on model rules through copyright by finding a state that's essentially implementing them verbatim and, right. and, and republishing that. Uh, right. We did the same thing with the uh, rules of professional conduct, uh, ABA model rules. Uh, but UCC has always been a very tough nut to crack in that respect. If, if there's anybody in the room who likes to get sued, besides <laughs> Carl, <laughs> <laughs> would be a good thing to be sued about. I've had my eye on the UCC for a while, and I've been trying to figure out if that looks like a worthwhile thing to, to do. Uh, uh, practically, whether it, you know it's instant, you know, lawsuit, go to jail thing, or or interesting legal <laughs> question. That, uh, yeah. I, I never do anything without EFS approval, as, and also consult other folks before doing these things. But good thinking. It's yeah. great that you have access to that to let you sort of be braver and do more than the average person. Um, all right, so we've got some unresolved issues. I think we have, you know, certainly the risk of real chilling as a result of some of the uncertainty. So, you know, what do you do about that? I think we've kicked around all the ideas, and, and this morning was sort of a preview uh, of this. But there are three, you know, big buckets of things you can do. One, you try to change the law. And the world would be a much easier place if Section 105 uh, wasn't just limited to federal materials, but also said, you know, something about state law. And again. You know, the federal rule is incredibly broad. It's anything a federal government employee creates in the course of their work. You probably don't want such a broad rule for states. There are good policy arguments for some kinds of, you know, completely non-legal textual materials maybe should have copyright. But you could at least envision a change that said state statutes, state court decisions, state rules, uh, administrative, you know, any sort of binding legal kind of material of a state shall not be copyrighted. Be very simple to do, uh, but at the same time impossible to do. Changing law in this sort of way is incredibly difficult, and as neat as the result would be, it's I think most people think a non-starter as a uh, sort of at least short or medium-term real solution uh, to the problem. So if you don't do that, uh, you can sue or get sued. Uh, you know the problem there is, as Carl said this morning, he's running around like crazy trying to get sued, right? Saying, please sue me. Look, I'm using your stuff. Here it is. Uh, please sue me. Um, you know, I, I, think, I think that's exactly the right approach. You know, someday maybe someone will, or maybe someone will continue to threaten you enough that you can file a declaratory judgment action. Um, you know, lawsuits take a long time. They don't always get to the right result, as we said. There's some risk with them. So it isn't, uh, I think, certainly not the only strategy or even the best strategy. I think putting yourself out there in a position where you might get sued and then being able, being willing to run with it if that happens is, is really important. You know, the great thing is in the process, you know, every time someone decides not to sue you when you've stuck it under their nose and dared you to, you've really contributed to the third thing, which is sort of creating actual practice and using persuasion. You, you put facts on the ground and say, look, you know, law.gov has got all this material, it's up, it's publicly available, we're using it. You never came along and sued anybody. You know, we've now got 47 different uh, you know, regulations from these entities. There's never been a lawsuit. That becomes very powerful, uh, both as a legal matter, but also as a matter of persuasion when you go to the, the next state uh, legislative 
commission or when you go to law school deans or when you go to people in the White House or whoever, you can say, look, we're, we're doing a huge amount of this and nobody has yet stepped in to sue. Um, so, you know, sort of uh, tried to say, I think the approach uh, that you're taking so far of both creating as much usage, as much uh, posting as possible to show how valuable it is and can be done and then trying to change as many minds as you can through simple statements, like the Dean's letter that says, by the way, this stuff is not subject to copyright. Uh, that is exactly the way to proceed. So, uh, that's it. Let's, we have a few minutes to talk about it. Uh, lots of different issues. As I said, some of these things have been talked about in great detail. Pam Samuelson and Brian Carter spent about an hour and 20 minutes uh, at Berkeley talking about this. Uh, discussion at Duke, so there's a tremendous amount of detail you can go into sort of hit the high points today. We're happy to drill down further if you want to any part of that. So, so there's one nagging issue, and it's what I call the agent of the state theory, which is, um, I'll grant you that, that um, head notes from Wes, for example, are, are perfectly copyrightable, right? That's their original material. Um, any vendor ought to be able to summarize the law and make that a value-added product. But in many cases, um, a vendor is, becomes the official distributor of the reports. And my question is, does that affect their ability to copyright it when they are the sole exclusive source of the official reports? Does that somehow change the, the argument about the strength of, of their, their assertions? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, my sense is, as a legal matter, probably not. As long as the stuff we're talking about, the head notes, the summary decision, or whatever, aren't legally binding in the way that the case is. Okay. So, you know, if it's just sort of this extra gloss, uh, you know, it, it seems wrong, it seems bad policy that the state is paying to have this done, or at least, you know, like the state's probably getting paid, actually, but, but the state is turning this over to someone and it's that piece isn't available. But in terms of what matters to citizens, it's access to the law, to the, the operative piece. You know how this is solved by vendors, by the way. Triple keying is, is what happens. What you do is you buy the books, and you send them to the Philippines or Thailand or India, and they're typed three times. Um, and by having them typed three times, you know you got it right. And every one of the vendors, Fastcase, Lexus, all the others, all of them have this material triple key, and that's how they get the material, the, the underlying law, recovered. And some leave page numbers in, and some don't leave page numbers in, and they have different ways of doing it. But each of these documents that are official or reports are recopied at least a dozen times from the paper because they can't do it electronically because right. yeah, occasionally they do a cross license agreement. Right. right. But the smaller vendors like Fastcase, they, they literally send the books overseas. And if you think back to, to what Lessig said yesterday about the potential for real economic value from being able to build on open materials, that seems so crazy and so silly and so wasteful. Right? Why should you have people paying to you know retype stuff? It's plenty available in electronic form. It's just the government won't make it available to everyone in this form. Uh, instead, they sort of pick, you know, the particular vendor, and then you're stuck dealing with their stuff. Yeah. Uh, and I would reframe how governments do it because, at least for Massachusetts, um, at one point there was a big contract to who's going to print it. So it wasn't like West. Or, I mean, they did compete to come in with the lowest price. Mm -hmm. So, um, is it the official version? Yes, but there was a con. It was about printing. It wasn't about becoming official. So there's, to me, there's a nuance there around that. And maybe what we need to do is to get governments to go out to bid more often. I mean, if you want to open up the market, but then you have to go back and recreate it, and then you know whoever wins the bid at the beginning has a leg up. But I do think there is a nuance there that West did come in to become Massachusetts' official version. They won a printing contract to become that. I don't know. To me, there's no one there. I don't know what it means, but right. And I assume that's a bigger issue that they <laughs> grapple with, which is you know you, you want an official version that's electronic, fully available, and maybe you do have a contract with someone to print. You know, to the extent we keep doing this much longer, you know, print the nice bound version. But that doesn't mean that everyone else can't have access to the same underlying material. You get back into the authentication issues, obviously. But you know, if everyone can get the electronic stuff, so they don't have to retype anything, they don't have to scan and then worry about uh, you know OCR issues. But they just everybody gets the same core thing in the same format, and then maybe someone has a contract to print it because that's a convenience. But it's fully available to everyone else. Would, would you 
with something of a gleam in my eye, I, I will say that Wisconsin has two official words. Of everything. Benton or? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, and this, the, the way in which we have bound this notion of official status into a system of monopolistic barter is, <laughs> it, it's, it's a blight. And, and now, I mean, maybe it made sense in the day when all we had was printing and printing was enormously cumbersome and expensive. But now in a world where the stuff starts electronically, and that's what's crazy about all of this. You look at, at you know, book scanning and other things. So these days, everything starts electronically, ends up on paper, then in some cases people glued it back into electronic form. That's nuts. You know, in those days, should be over. Yeah. To me, the, the huge issue that I don't see the answer to is the standards industry currently is funded through the copyrighted sale of their print standards. If if we manage to figure out a way to free all that, we have to find a new man, a, a new way to fund the standards. And so, I mean, I think we. I don't know. If we, do, do you have a, an answer to that one? Or? Yes, I do because I've dealt with this a lot. When I put the National Electrical Code up, um, you know, that is officially copyrighted by the National Fire Protection Association. And my nightmare is the fire chief standing up and explaining that I'm killing babies because they're unable to do high quality codes anymore because they depend on the revenue. Yep. So I spent a lot of time looking at their revenue. About 17% of their revenue is from the sales of these standards documents. And I'll grant you they will face an IBM moment if their stuff is more broadly available. But they make a tremendous amount of money from conferences, from annotated versions, from the interim versions that are not official, from you know, special you know, value added CDs. <coughs> And I, I think there is a great opportunity there to increase their market, to, to give them the ability to continue to make a lot of money. Um, in the VEC case, one of the things they pointed out is that the NFPA would be making this code even if they didn't have copyright because it's the business that they're in. Uh, they want them to be turned into the law. In fact, many of these model codes um, at the beginning have a sample resolution that says, we the people of insert name of jurisdiction here, do hereby adopt. Um, and, and so it's it's an issue for them, but it's not a make or break. I think they will still exist and, and survive very well. And I'll grant you a 17% revenue hit is real. Um, on the other hand, pull up the revenues, um, you know, the, the, the nonprofit tax returns for a lot of these operations. And NFPA is 40 million a year, and they're paying, you know, 600 to $800,000 salaries. And, um, they're, they're, I mean, they, they have some revenues. And they're, and they're typical. I mean, you know they're, they're pretty typical. typical. ICC is a huge business, and we're talking million-dollar salaries there. Uh, the plumbing codes are pretty big as well. Um, and I, I think there is a potential. They would have to adjust. Now, ANSI is a, is a slightly different issue because some of their stuff is meant to be in law. Some of their stuff is not. Um, but uh, when I spoke to the ABA Rulemaking Institute, I had a whole bunch of government officials come up to me and say one of their big issues is the incorporation by reference problem because they incorporate the technical standards. And then even the bureaucrats in these agencies can't afford to get the standards that are the law. And their customers out there in the small business world and, and the others that have to, to do them. And so one of the things they have to consider when they adopt one of these things is can we afford to like incorporate this by by reference? Um, but yeah, private law is a huge issue, huge huge issue. Yeah. yeah. I mean, early on, you you said that there's a difference between if someone's buying the rights to public, you know, if if government is is receiving money from a publisher, that's different from the copyright. But I think you can't ignore that because what are they buying? Or what are they paying the government for? I mean, you can make the, you know, the, you know, I mean, the counter uh, um, counter argument back. Um, the counter argument is we're paying for the copyright in order to publish this. I mean, that's how they'll posit it. Right. I just think you have to, you know. Each yeah, I think that's again. I think that's as an explanation of a revenue stream and what happens after that. That may be right. I don't think it changes the original incentive to create the law in the first place. Um, uh, but I also think you know that too maybe made sense at one point in time. But now that we have a lot of ways we can make the law available and publish the law, don't necessarily need to have people uh, paying to get the monopoly right to do it. That just that no longer makes sense. If it ever did. Yeah. 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 Yeah
Sorry? Yeah, Sam Lamar in the lunch. Just to add on to that comment or to answer Eric's question, and I think this isn't just the physical access point as well. It's not necessarily the one you're paying for the copyright. They, they can just be paid. It's physical access, just like the terms of use on the website condition your access to it. So I don't think Right. It's a little like you know being a museum that has a bunch of wonderful 17th century paintings. But there's no copyright in those paintings, but you control who comes into the museum, whether they take photographs. Yeah, but museums you know. have asserted that when people take pictures and right. try to publish pictures in a book. Even federal museums assert that, yeah, right. which becomes particularly Right, interesting. exactly. I'm, right. Not saying, I'm, I'm not saying they're right, but I'm saying the argument has and will be made. Right, right. and it, it should fail. All right. Time for lunch, thank you. Okay, we'll start again at one o'clock.